So this, this consumer who moves through this new landscape um, moves through a landscape that's also markedly different from when TDK was putting together those ads. Um, this is a partial map um, of the top properties of the nation's 4 billion plus media elite. Um, because what I want to talk about now is the idea that the media landscape in which um, consumers are participating and which media properties are moving is one where ideas of spreadability um, are more important than ideas of fixitude and stickiness. So I raise this to say this is a, uh, a sample of all of the property, pro bleh, possible channels through which someone can consume media content. It seems really passe now to say something like one of the greatest challenges that media faces is the fragmentation of the audiences. Because for pretty much my entire existence, audiences have been fragmented. What's happened, however, is the way that media properties move through this fragmented landscape is changing. The challenge when we talk about fragmentation is a challenge of aggregating audiences when you have fewer audiences to aggregate. Convergence culture um, is uh, an environment where perhaps we need to think about not trying to aggregate audiences, but propagating audiences across a multi uh, multiple sites of engagement. So this is this idea I'm talking about when I'm talking about spreadability. And I'm trying to suggest that perhaps content that spreads through multiple channels and picks up tiny audiences in multiple spaces is going to be more successful than content that tries to draw large numbers of people to single distribution streams. So these are four examples um, of, of successful viral campaigns, but four kind of key examples of spreadable media. Um, the first one on the, on the top right is the, the Lazy Sunday clip from um, Saturday Night Live, which really demonstrated to a lot of, of, I think, the media world, but I also think the media business world more generally, the potential for YouTube as a distribution platform. But YouTube is only a good distribution platform for certain forms of content. Uh, if you want to be an arr, pirate and you want to use YouTube to distribute content um, that... Um, you know, that's going to tear down, say, DVD sales or something, then I think you're kidding yourself because it's a really crap environment to try and distribute long-form content. If you want to tell your friend what the funniest thing was that was on the Family Guy last night, YouTube is a great platform to do it because YouTube, its, it's uh, condition of use, um, the way that it's organised, the content that it exists and the communicative ecology in which it functions is one that emphasises or, or capitalises on quotability and grabability. So if you can grab a chunk of content and put it on YouTube, if you can quote something and put it on YouTube, you can use YouTube successfully. And so when Saturday Night Live goes out across YouTube, it becomes this massive viral event and people are embedding it in places and, and everything. And that's totally awesome if what you want to do is spread content. But if what you want to do is get people to come back to your website and see the ads that sell against this content, then having, YouTube, then having uh, Lazy Sunday on YouTube and having it go out to a massive number of people is actually really bad because it drives people away. And so we're stuck in this kind of paradoxical situation where consumers are taking commodities, media properties, transforming them into cultural artefacts, you know, elements that make sense, that articulate a sense of identity. And that used to be a measure of success. But it used to be a measure of success when engaging in those cultural practices meant coming within the proximity of advertising that was sold in ad breaks on television. Now that coming um, in, into proximity of this content happens outside of those conditions of fixed context, all of a sudden, getting lots and lots of people to see your thing may not actually be uh, a measure of success. Um, on the, the left, we, we have OKGo, OK who capitalised on, on the, the spreadability of, of YouTube in order to become successful, basically. By posting all of their clips there, they set up a... Uh, they establish enough of a, um, of a following it through an alternative um, distribution platform. They didn't need mainstream channels. Um, on the right, we have some Serbian chicken, um, which uh, uh, was a really quite good underground kind of campaign where people didn't quite understand exactly what it was, but they knew it was something worth talking about. And ultimately, it was an ad for Burger King. Um, and on the left, we have Mentos and Soda. 
Um, the Mendels and Soto is a very, very interesting, um, a very, very interesting experiment because it came out of the kind of uh, the, the, the cultural environment itself. And Mentos saw it and realised that it was happening and decided to, to give them some support. And then it became then an official, uh, an official kind of Mentos event. Um, and so the other thing about, about spreadability, and this comes back to this paradox, is that we live in an environment where advertising content circulates as entertainment. But it does so outside of many of the, the channels in which, uh, in which it might be able to track its success. So on the top, um, we, we have the, the, the uh, Grand Theft Auto-esque Coke ad that was passed around the internet as you know, a, an awesome piece of machinima. And on the bottom left, we have a, another ad for Coke that was done in conjunction with Blizzard. Now, the one on the top was passed through, um, uh, through uh, internet groups that were interested in, in video games and, and machinima and those sorts of things, and it spread as content that people thought was worth watching. What's so interesting about the Coke ad down the bottom is that it only screened in the Chinese market, but because people thought it was uh, entertainment that was compelling enough to share, it circulated outside of the Chinese market without any efforts on the part of Coke. And now it still functions essentially or ostensibly as an ad for Coke because, you know, it's, it's Coke branded and it has all of, the, all of the, the logos that you need. But what it does is it functions outside of the cultural environment in which it was created um, without needing to navigate the channels um, of, of selling the content internationally. And this spreadability and spreadability for success we see in the success of both Colbert um, and of Jon Stewart. Now, we're in an environment where people are starting to, to kind of crack down on spreadability because if you want to participate in this environment, you need to be a proper participant. And quite recently, we have two things that have indicated that, that perhaps uh, big media companies aren't quite sure how to participate um, as you know, a producer of spreadable content. Um, and the first is the, is the revocation of NBC um, just recently of, all of its, pulling all of its content down from iTunes. Now, that's kind of a... a it's a, an, issue, a, an issue that is deeper than I have time to go into now, but I think it, all, it, it does point to some of the problems um, that come from just putting your content into channels and not necessarily realising um, that you are, as a content producer, your um, relationship with your consumers is different than if you are a content distributor. And that seems to be NBC's um, uh, quandary. For the first time, it is now being positioned solely as a content producer. Whereas it used to be able to, di to dictate um, the, the uh, context of distribution. And on the bottom left, we have um, uh, a political ad. Uh, sorry, it was an ad for this guy uh, in the tie who was going for um, uh, uh, school council? Like school council thing? We don't do it back home. School board. School board. And he made a bunch of ads for school board and he put them up on YouTube. Um, and a VH1 program um, called Web Junk that does a daily roundup of, of everything that's happening on the internet pulled it down and featured it in their, in their program. Now that's fine because the conditions under which the content was posted on YouTube let that happen, the licensing conditions. What happened is that that content was then reposted to YouTube within, um, with, with, with the, v, the VH1 clip. And Viacom asked for a cease and desist because it ostensibly owned that content itself. And this is one of the, the problems that, that we're getting to where if you want to spread your content through these channels, you need to understand that there are certain conditions of entry and that there are certain modes of participation by which you need to abide. And these are modes of participation that might be straining um, uh, the legal conditions and also our attitude towards ownership. And the final thing about spreadability is to realise that, that the contexts of consumption have changed dramatically. This is how I watch most of my television. Uh, I, I went on, a, on, a, on a, uh, a boycott in February, actually it was, it was an academic experiment, to see if I, could, if I could stay up to date consuming content only from official channels online. So I actually switched off the cable and stopped watching television um, in the lounge room. Um, and what I did was use official sites like InnerTube and those sorts of places, but eventually it got to the limits of what I could consume, and so then I started to dig around elsewhere. Um, and there are a bunch of sites internationally uh, and, and nationally, but not so much, that allow you to watch content, you know, on your laptop. And so I do it when I'm working, and it runs in Windows along the side. Um, but that's CS, so down the bottom is, is the stream from, from InnerTube. But up the top uh, is a stream uh, from a, a Chinese channel, a Korean channel, sorry. Um, where I'm watching CSI with Korean subtitles. So 
It, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter because it's in English, so I can just, you know, listen to it and watch it. But I'm watching it with partial attention. I mean, it's playing in a small window on my laptop. You know, this is not that DVD home theatre experience. So the fact that it might not be, you know, awesome quality and it might have Korean subtitles and every now and then the picture might wobble a bit, that, that's OK because I'm not treating it with my entire attention. But these are the con these international um, contexts and also, you know, watching just discrete program units on a laptop are uh, some of the, the different contexts in which content now circulates. And these are contents, uh, contexts against which it is very hard um, to sell advertising because you don't kind of, you can't, uh, you can't guarantee the juxtaposition of the ad and the content itself. Um, and of course the light bright reminds us that the environment, the, the context in which things are now different. I was going to talk about that, but I, I don't think I will. Um, so the second thing that's, that's happening as we talk about this changed environment is that what it means to be a viewer is changing. And we're now talking more and more, um, not so much about viewership, but about the idea of engaging with media properties. And how exactly we do engage with media properties, how we measure that engagement, and even what that term engagement itself means, um, is one that we're struggling with and, and, and we're struggling to define. So this was one effort that got a lot of press. Um, uh, uh, this was an effort by a company called IPG to map out the touch points for engagement. So the idea was that you know, these are all of the different possible places where people can come into contact with content. So if you're developing content that spreads across multiple sites, you've got these 33 different touch points. And uh, there, there was a, a larger discussion about how if people engage or, or experience content through different touch points, they might be more engaged than viewers who experience uh, content through one touch point and all of this kind of stuff. It's ultimately problematic to try and understand engagement this way because it suggests that doing something like watching a mobisode or downloading a ringtone is in some way a kind of parallel or equal experience um, to watching content you know, in your lounge room um, with, with, uh, with the lights turned down. But what it does start to uh, get at is that in, a, in an, uh, an environment where engagement uh, is important, we're coming to an environment where expressions are a better way to understand what people are actually doing and how they're participating with your content than measuring impressions. And so quantitative um, ratings, for instance, are all based around the idea of impressions. If somebody saw your content X number of times in this lovely, soft, plush environment next to, well, obviously not next to Janet Jackson's nipple because that might offend them, you know, then they'll have a, a warm and rosy attitude towards um, your content. We're now getting to the point where we're saying, well, if people aren't watching content in that way, and what if they're not actually acting on this impression, how do we understand it? One of the ways to understand it is to look at expressions about what people are doing. And so quite recently, we had tons and tons of nuts sent peanuts sent to CBS to protest the cancellation of Jericho. More and more, we see fans, um, and even more and more ordinary audiences, um, performing these quite large expressions of uh, affinity, of uh, affection um, to media properties. And trying to work out how we can measure expressions, and I'm sorry I don't have the answer to that just yet, but trying to work out how we can measure and value expressions is a way to understand, I think, or one of the ways to understand, um, success in a convergence culture environment. And so perhaps if someone goes to the trouble of posting your content online, or of writing about it favourably, or of writing about it unfavourably, or of mashing it up, or something or other, that suggests some mode of engagement. And what happens in, in and this is the final point that I make in this environment, is that we, we've run out of ways to talk about um, who the audience is. And so we have all of these terms to talk about media audiences, but many of these terms are, audience, uh, are, ter are phrases that essentially do away with the idea of the media audience itself. Much of this language comes either um, uh, from marketing rather than audience studies, and that's cool, um, but a lot of it comes from things like um, user... Uh, uh, now I can't think of the, of, of the, of the acronym. It comes from um, like computer studies, engagement, how do people use machines and those sorts of things. This is a model of use. It's not a model of viewership. It's not a model of audiencehood. It's a model of use. And as soon as we start to talk about users, what it means to be an audience member becomes fundamentally problematic. Because users are people that produce things. And if they're producing things, 
you know, whether they're doing mods for video games or they're, um, uh, they're making machinima or as um, Rob Kosnitz talks about, you know, they're making their own episodes of Star Trek because Star Trek never told the stories that it promised to tell and they'd really like to see those stories told, then how do we understand who they actually are? I mean, they're not viewers, they're not passive, they're not sitting on the couch, but they're not professional producers. You know, they don't participate in the same fields that we do. They don't have access to exactly the same tools or the same channels of distribution. And so, and this is something I hinted at before, I think we're in, a, we're in an environment where what we're actually talking about is not necessarily the relationship between producers and consumers, but the relationship between differently abled, differently equipped uh, producers, some of whom have a lot of money and resources behind them, and some of whom don't. Some of whom have access to the top level, top tier channels, and some of whom don't. But also, some of whom participate um, in communities, right? And these are communities based on uh, ideals of social relation, based on civic engagement, based on uh, insider relations or, or emotional commitment, right? They make content and share it for free because it enriches the community in which they participate rather than producers who, produce in, who participate in markets. You know, and these are environments um, where the trade of content or even the production of content is based on um, kind of contractual relationships, where everything is transactionally based, um, where it's a zero-sum game, uh, it's profit-oriented, and they're used to kind of trading with outsiders. And so we're, we're in an environment now where we have different modes of production taking place, and people from the left are, are, are entering the environment on the right. You know, when they invite um, users to, to participate or, or, or people to make ads for Chevy. And people on the right are moving into the conditions on the, on the left when they mod something, when they make an ad, when they participate in a contest. But these are two environments that operate under not necessarily the same logics. Um, and Kosnitz talks about the fact that, that productive fans in building out these stories about Star Trek have essentially kept the Star Trek brand itself alive, despite the fact that the, that the professional productions you know, have not done so well. And Kosnitz's ultimate argument about the way that, that uh, amateur or fan producers interact with pro professional producers is one that says ultimately Star Trek could continue to be um, uh, a profitable property as long as Universal just left it alone. Because fans keep bringing new fans into the fold, and those new fans go and buy DVDs, and those new fans you know, participate in Star Trek um, conventions. You know, and fans produce new content that brings new fans into the fold. And so yes, you know, whoever owns it needs to do some work on it, but maybe they need to listen to the fan group a little bit more to understand um, the way that the property is, is revered, or the logics through which it, uh, it flows. So. There are three things, I think, that, that uh, probably sum up what I'd like you to end up with now that we've gone on this long and winding journey to get here. And the first one is this idea that interactivity is a property of technologies, but participation is a property of culture. And so if we're dealing with you know, cultural groups, if we're dealing with cultural practices, then we're not talking about building you know, a, a better cell phone. We're talking about understanding how you can get your cell phone used by um, participants within a culture. But participatory culture requires that you're a participant. And in order to be a participant, you need to um, work out how the culture itself operates. You know, and so, for instance, suing people may not be the right way to deal with um, productive fans. And the final thing is that participation um, requir requires changed attitudes towards control whether it's control over properties themselves, whether it's control over the context of consumption, or in the case of NBC and iTunes, whether it's control over access to your consumers and who your consumers might be. We're running just down to 10 o'clock. Um, I was going to take some questions, um, but I'm not sure if we're going to have time. Uh, like one question. One question. So make it good. <laughs> or two short ones. Uh, anybody have a question for Joshua? <laughs> so okay, the, the, the consortium uh, is is uh, a corporately sponsored um, cons research consortium. So we work with MTV Networks, uh, Yahoo, GSCNM down in Austin, um, a financial investment company, um, and um, uh, Turner at the moment. 
Um, we're negotiating with uh, a bunch of other companies, some games develop and, and those sorts of things. If you want to give me a card, I can certainly send you a prospectus and we can talk. Uh, okay, this is going to be... Do you guys want to have battle to the death? No. If we make it quick, we can take both these questions. Sir, so, and then ma'am. Yep. So, one of the one of the one when, of can everybody hear the question? Okay. Uh, yes. No. Yes. No. So uh, <clears throat> there's. I'll just paraphrase. Possibly uh, <laughs> the uh, just the amount of does everybody have to actually produce content? There's a time constraint issue. So can you still be, you know, participate? I think without creating a bunch of content. And media. So can, can you participate without being a top level fan? The answer is yes. Right. Partly because. Fan, fans, there's two things we need to understand about fans. Fans are lead users. So fans are demonstrating some of the practices that are becoming more and more ordinary. Um, part of the argument that we're trying to pursue or we're trying to make is not that everybody needs to become a fan, and that's the way we need to understand what's going on, but that fandom gives us a good kind of far-out view of the practices that are taking place. And the second thing to realise are that uh, participatory audiences are incredibly unruly. So there are a bunch of game producers, particularly, who like to use um, their user group to develop content. Now that brings with it a bunch of problems, right? Let's not talk about legal ownership for a second. Let's talk about trying to roll out a property. Very difficult to roll out a property when you've got uh, an amateur and unpaid labour force who are doing it in their spare time, who halfway through the production birth a child or uh, lose a job or something like that. Um, and yet, they may have a whole bunch of skills um, that might actually uh, be uh, really useful for the property they're producing. So when you're dealing with participatory audiences, you're dealing with an unruly mob who work to their own rules. And those rules are not necessarily the rules of the market. So you can't crack the whip over them or lock them in the office um, you know, in order to get them to finish the job. You can't impose on them the, the same kind of conditions that we do workers, perhaps. Um, you need to work with them and collaborate with them. And so fan production often ta takes place according to a different pace. Someone may, because they're doing it for the love of it or the cred they might get within the fan community, they may take a much, much longer time than would be profitable in order to produce this property. And also the final thing um, is that you know, there are differing degrees of participation. Um, I'm a massive, massive participant in Wikipedia, but I've never written an article and I very rarely write paragraphs. I really believe in the Wikipedia project, um, but I think that my role in the Wikipedia is to be a copy editor because I use it multiple times during the day, but I've never actually felt the compulsion to write you know, an entire entry myself. But it's so very easy for me to click on edit and to go in and to fix the spelling or you know, fix an errant kind of bit of formatting. And that's a mode of participation. Is it more or less valuable than the guy who invents all the stubs or the guy who writes the entries about Mozambique? I'd say, well, of course, I'd say no because I think I'm a valued participant. Um, but I, I think you can make a case that it's not because it's participation and we have differing levels of participation. Same way we have differing levels of viewership. And then we go back to... Mm. Is it a situation in which um, just, uh, I can't remember the, how we see this, but any, any, um, any publicity is good publicity. So mm. um, those two concepts are things that, that I'm thinking about in terms of, you know, to get it out there is bad news. Does it matter as long as it's out there? I'm hoping everybody heard that because uh, we need to move on. So okay, go ahead. Cool. I'll, I'll do this very, very quickly. Um, okay, to answer your first point, um, there was an interesting debate that bubbled up uh, a little while ago around the time that Nature did a, a study of Britannica and, um, and the Wikipedia for kind of uh, errors, right? And basically said that actually Wikipedia gets it right more times than Britannica on average, right? Um, there was a, a debate within the academic community about, you know, the value of Wikipedia and whatever. I'm not sure that Wikipedia did anything other than challenge the peer review process. 
I don't think that it challenges, challenged expert processes because we still need experts. You know, we still need professional creatives of all things because bloody hell, if we relied on fans, we get all of those horrendous Heinz ads that came out when Heinz invited people to make ads and people decided that using Heinz as toothpaste was, you know, a great way to advertise the product. You know, we still need experts, we still need professional producers. But what you're an expert in and who are the experts, I think, changes. So uh, I uh, happen to be an expert in Australian television. Um, I happen to be lucky enough to be in an environment where I get to write about it for a living. I know a bunch of people who are also experts in Australian television who aren't in that environment. You know, and so we have different modes of, of participation. Is it all publicity is good publicity? That's a really interesting question. And that's my way of deflecting it because I'm regularly asked, you know, what's the value of this? Is it about increasing brand awareness? Is it about brand affinity? Is it about brand equity? Is it about something else? Um, and some of the questions that are kind of crucial to the work that we're doing is, uh, uh, how do you respond when someone says something critical about, you know, y y your property? Um, so I don't know that all publicity is, is necessarily good publicity, but I don't really have yet a pithy answer to your question. Okay. All right, Joshua Green from MIT. Thank, Thank you very much. <laughs>